So throughout this series, we've been going through the big themes of Methodism, of Wesleyan theology, and we've been looking at how they, they apply to our faith, not just as, as Methodists, but as United Methodists, as people who are seeking to grow in our love of God through all that we do. And we started with the knowledge that we can't fix things on our own. That's just not how we're wired. Some things, uh, most things are beyond our ability to do anything more than just kind of patch them up. And so that we are in need of grace. We also know that very often we don't know all of the things that we need to know. And so we need help and support and guidance so that we can figure out and understand uh, what to do. We are in need of God's grace. That grace fixes our sin that comes as a result of free will. That grace, grace keeps us humble so that we are always searching for what is right and good and what it is that God is calling us to. But the question that remains for us is, how do we go forward? What does that even look like? We have received God's grace, but now what? What's the next thing? The answer to that, of course, as everyone knows, is the quadrilateral, right? That's exactly what everyone was thinking of. Uh, I know that is such a wonderfully bureaucratic, boring, and dry response to give to what feels like it should be such a very, very important question in all that we do. But the good news is, is that that actually is helpful for us. It is hopeful for us to know that that is the response because it, what it means is that we have been given already the tools that we need. God has given them to us, but here's the bad news. Are we using them? Are we using the tools that God has provided? I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again because it's a great example of me needing to learn to use my own tools that I have <clears throat> and because this is still an important lesson for me. But it, uh, it's a, a story about... Uh, back in the day, when uh, I was going to Boy Scout camp, and we were down, and this was the first year that we went to camp where I was going down as the senior patrol leader. Or if you know how Boy Scouts works, the, uh, the adults are meant to be there in advisory capacities only. It's the boys who are supposed to run things. It's one of the things I love about Boy Scouts is that the boys are supposed to be in charge. And so nominally, I was in charge of our troop at Boy Scout camp that summer. I was in charge, but I didn't know what to do with that. And so there was one night we were trying to get up to the dining hall for dinner, and there I was standing at, at the top of our campsite. Our campsite was on a bit of a hill, and I was yelling down to, to the rest of the guys to get them to come out and to get ready to go to dinner. Now with a bunch of middle school, junior high, and a few high school boys in there, you can imagine the kind of success I was having, right? Not much of any success in the middle of all of that. and. Uh, uh, one of the adult leaders let me go for a second, and he pulled me aside, and he uh, said, well, that's not working very well, is it? But no, it's not. And he said, well, why don't you just go down there to them and try it again? That was an absurdly easy thing to do. It was a stupidly easy thing to do that I should have thought of, even not having uh, done much of that before. Uh, but, it was, but it stuck with me, and now 30 years later, I am still learning from that absurdly easy lesson that he taught me all those years ago. I had the tool that I needed the entire time, I just didn't know how to use it. So I was finally learning how to use that tool. We have been given the tools that we need, and God expects us to use them. Thankfully, though, also, we know as people of faith that have received God's grace that he gives us help along the way. He doesn't expect us to automatically know how to use them. He will teach as well. This is one of the lessons that Jesus is trying to get across when he is telling the story of the parable of the talents. The basics of the story is that a man is getting ready to go on a journey, and he has three servants. So he gives to each of those servants an amount of money, each that he is entrusting to them, and each according to their ability. Those two things are really important parts of this story. And so he does that, and he goes away. And there is an expectation because of this that they are going to manage what they have been given, i.e. that they're going to do something with this. Eventually, the man comes back, and two of the servants have doubled what they, what they had been given, and they are rewarded because of their, of their good work. The third one literally buried it in a hole in the ground. 
And uh, the, uh, the man who had given it to him takes it from him and sends him to a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's a joke I tell about that that I have to have an uh, Irish accent for, so I always want to say that with an Irish accent. There's something about being able to do that that I can't do today. Um, but a modern equivalent of this story is to say it's like the owner of a company that is going on an extended sabbatical, and so he pulls in his senior management, uh, his vice presidents of departments and divisions that are the heads of subsidiary companies, and he tells them that they're going to be in charge for a while, they have all of the things that they need, and that he will check in with them when he gets back. Well, after the sabbatical is over, the owner comes back and, uh, and uh, sees the results of what had gone on. Two of them had done very well, and so they're rewarded greatly for what they had done. The third one did absolutely nothing, uh, barely even touched the, the stuff that was under his, under his control and under his authority while the owner had been gone. And the owner, uh, you know, demotes him takes him out of that position and gives him a new job now to take this long list of uh, service vehicles, service trucks they had in their fleet that whose registration was out of date. And took them to a local DMV that is understaffed and says, fix the problem. And there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. I don't know what hell it would look like, but I think that's probably pretty close. The point is this. Keep in mind that with Jesus, that his harshest reactions and his harshest criticisms and statements that he makes are all reserved for people who should know better already, who had been entrusted with uh, certain things, who uh, had been given according to their ability. We can infer, as he was telling this story, that there were folks who were expected to do something. Now notice we're not... It's not that they were expected to make money or to have positive value that was gained from this. Um, it, what we're given to believe is that they were called to do, uh, called to do something. The worst thing you could do in this situation was to not do anything. In fact, I think we can even say that if things had gone badly, maybe they wouldn't have been uh, rewarded as much as what they had, had happened, but there would have been something that would have come to them to help them and support them in the future. Jesus would rather that we do something out of faith, that we engage with our faith, and one of the worst things that we could do would be to allow fear to keep us from acting at all. John Wesley, in describing our faith as he does, bases it in grace, and that should tell us something. But he also focuses on conferencing with each other, reading and educating ourselves, and attending upon all the ordinances of God. That's something we'll come back to at a later time. But all of that is to tell us that we need to engage with our faith, not just to passively receive it. Seeking to understand our faith requires work and effort, not just simply sitting back. So we start with Scripture. As we look at the quadrilateral, there are four, there are four parts of this. The quadrilateral is a, is a bad name, but it works as far as, uh, as names go for things. But we start with Scripture. This is God's primary revelation to his people. This is the story of the long arc of redemption of God's people. That is what we receive in Scripture. And much as it was written, we, uh, we were never intended to just blindly accept what was written. Because it was written in a different time, in a different place, in a different language. By its nature, we have to engage with it in order to understand whether we are Methodist or whether we are something else. We need to engage. And the ways that we engage with Scripture come down to those categories of tradition, reason, and experience. Those are the other three pieces of that quadrilateral. Tradition is history. The ways that we have done things or understood things in the past. To engage with tradition is not to just do as we have always done, but to know what we have done and decide do we continue in this direction or do we do differently. Reason is how we put together all of the different traditions that we have received as we seek to understand the scripture. The, we have a multitude of denominations, and even inside of uh, similar faith communities, we can have different sets of practices and traditions. And all of that is just the different ways that we have put this together. And our reason tells us 
Do we continue in the path that we have set in front of us? Or do we need to start new traditions? Do we need to put things together differently? Experience is probably the most common of these four pieces of the quadrilateral, but it's the one that is least admitted to. But it's the one we use the most. How does my own personal life and my own experiences shape how I understand the scripture in my faith? We look at our experiences. This is where maybe it's one of the hardest questions we have to answer. Are my, do my experiences tell me that I am doing as God has called me to do, or do I need to go in a different direction because I'm not going where God has called me to go? Much like the servants who had been given the talents, all of this tells us that we have the tools that we need to use. To try and deny the use of those tools, to try and deny those things, only just leads to weeping and gnashing of teeth. But to embrace it is to first know that we do so with God's grace. To remember, God wants to see the redemption of his people. That, that is the story of Scripture. And so we have received God's grace, and so we know that we don't have to be perfect at it, we don't have to be great at it, but we need to try. And then try with a great deal of humility, knowing that we're not always going to get it right. But then we grow as we do this, and as we grow under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, all of these things help us to understand just who God is. What tools do you have in your life? What tools are useful in helping you to understand what God is doing? Are you spending enough time to learn the tools that you already have, that God has already given us? How do you understand and how do you use the scripture first and then after that tradition, reason, and experience? I invite you to go into this week and uh, to take some time to reflect on just what those things are. To see, to look for the tools that God has already given to you. To look and see how you use them to understand your faith. And then as necessary, either continue on or make changes so that we are always seeking after God, after God and who God wants us to be. Let us do all of this in the name of the one who came and made it possible for us. Let us do this in Christ's name.